But let's begin with a prominent story here in South Africa. In fact, it's uh, dominated a lot of the corporate le releases out on the JSC Newswire service since earlier today. And that is the uh, JSC imposing a hefty fine of uh, half a million rand on Tabi Lyoka. This is a South African economist. It's uh, due to the falsified claims regarding her qualifications. So this incident has uh, sparked a crucial conversation about the importance of compliance and as well as due diligence when appointing board members. Members. For more, uh, my colleague Zanella Morrison spoke to Parmi Natasan, the CEO of the Institute of Directors in Southern Africa. Let's listen in. We've, we've done so much work around directed due diligence, um, drafted guidance papers, etc. And it's very clear in King 4 as well. King 4 has a specific recommendation that states exactly what should be checked or ascertained before someone is put forward um, to join a board as a non-executive director. Um, you know, it's for me, it's, it's, it's so interesting because companies will do such in-depth checks when they're employing people. So for general workers in the company, there'll be criminal checks, background checks, qualification checks, even credit checks run, etc. But then for some reason, we see instances like this where checks for non-executive directors who in fact play such a critical governance role of an organization and of course, the consequences of them not getting things right can be so large and dire for organizations and its stakeholders um, that it's quite disappointing that you see the same level of attention isn't necessarily paid there. Uh, you know, we've, we've in the past been very clear around, you need to be very certain around someone's um, track record. So it's about looking into their background, doing a search, um, considering whether there's any reputational matters that may impact the company before you're appointing someone. And then, of course, when you take it to the knowledge, skills and experience side, you really want to look into that's where the vetting of qualifications, vetting of prior experience, etc. comes into play. Mm. And, and in this instance, the, the issue really came around her qualifications. But the things you've just mentioned, all of them, um, can perhaps be also applied. You know, knowledge, skills and experience here. Yeah. How does a candidate, um, as in the case of Tabby, sit across such diverse boards? You know, what experience would somebody have to be at MTN, to be at Nedcare, to be at Ramgro, to be at Anglo-American? This is really a huge very diverse industries, yet we find that um, a single person can sit across all of them. Am I picking up something here that we also need to think about when we say skills and experience? I think industry experience is also important, and that's one thing we find may be lacking. So people may have general skills to be able to serve as non-executive directors, but are they sufficiently up-to-date and knowledgeable about the industry that they're serving in order to oversee things ask the right questions, really understand the strategy of that organization. And, and, and in this case, so the due diligence, I mean, a great example, you wouldn't hire an executive who doesn't have the experience or the skills, let alone the qualification. Whose responsibility is it on the board to ensure that this is, in, that this is applied effectively and appropriately for board members? Most times this would be executed within the organization, right? In the company secretarial sort of department, whoever is running with the admin around um, applications, interviewing candidates and ultimately appointing candidates. But having said that, it's definitely something the nominations committee of, of a board should, should have oversight into what is the due diligence that is conducted when board members are considered for appointment. I think uh, especially the, the nominations committee of the board um, I think also in this instance, you know, what bothers me is that many of the organizations that the person served on were listed on the JSC. And by virtue of being listed on the JSC, they are uh, required to apply King 4 in the listings requirements. Um, and King 4 was specific that a background check needs to be done. And if King 4 practices are not applied, there really should be explanation in the governance reporting about why they didn't apply it, why they thought it wasn't necessary, and what compensating factors they put in place to cover or, or uh, to address that risk. And we don't really see that. So it's, it makes one wonder whether listed companies are applying King 4 as it's meant to be applied or whether they're saying they're applying it, um, ticking boxes, etc., cetera, um, but not really... Um, you know, uh, putting in place the necessary governance controls. 
So then the JSC, which all of these listed companies are reporting to, they are able to issue out this penalty uh, against Tabi. Why not on the listed entities that are on the JSC? And also, if these companies have been uh, complying to JSC rules, uh, who does the check? Because um, if a company is not compliant, but the JSC is saying they're compliant, and when found not to be compliant, the individual and not the company held accountable. Perhaps explain to me um, what, how, what the logic or why that works in that way. Because she's not a listed entity, the companies are, and yet she's, um, uh, she has had to, to, to bear the brunt of what was done incorrectly by organizations listed on the JSC. Yeah, I mean, I think there should be accountability for both the individual and organizations when these sorts of things happen. Um, the JSC, I'm sure, have their processes in place and then they need to answer, you know, questions on what further action they're going to take. Um, certainly, I think, you know, questions could be asked around uh, the application of King 4 and the disclosure um, by the regulator. And so do you think that you will see any, um, well, let's hope and see what the JSE does and, and hopefully that's also transparent. Um, but how do we, or how do you as an organization, um, would li- how would you like to see transparency and to whom is that transparency? Because if it wasn't transparent to date uh, to anybody, this, con- this probably is going on as we speak and can continue to go on until another person is identified to sacrifice publicly. Mm. So I think it's a bigger question around disclosure of governance and the application of King 4, which we're certainly working on. So what we found in the past is uh, because of the apply and explain regime, organizations are meant to be explaining in the annual reporting or other somewhere else, maybe perhaps on the website, um, how they've applied King 4. And I think um, at the moment what we found is that becomes a little bit inconsistent and incomparable. And one of the things we're looking at it as a King at the moment um, is how we um, change things to make the governance reporting a little bit more um, consistent so that we can then, one, be able to compare from one company to another and two, be able to hold companies accountable as well. Mm. An interesting comment that was made yesterday in a, in a gathering of CEOs is also around uh, tenure. And there's a feeling that there isn't enough um, people available to enter into the board space. Thus, we see same people sitting across the board, as in the case of, of Tabi sitting across four completely different or five completely different boards. And, uh, you know, and that's a lot of boards to sit on. Do you find that there just isn't enough talent? And so the same people are there and have to be retained? in those roles? You know, I, I don't think we can say there's not enough talent. You know, at the Institute of Directors, we have over 9,000 members and we also have two director designations of which many hundreds of people now hold those designations. So those people certainly are there and available to serve. And um, I think the issue is more around how board appointments get filled. So more and more... Um, You see, especially on the larger organizations, that when there's a vacancy, um, there's perhaps uh, uh, going around the table saying, does anyone know somebody that we could approach who's got this specific skill or this specific uh, experience or demographic or whatever it is um, that they're looking for? So what happens then is that um, the same people tend to get appointed because it's the people who are working with each other on other boards and, and then they recommend each other onto uh, whichever other boards are looking for vacancies at that point in time. Mm. Um, and yet, uh, this has been the case for as long as we've been in this industry. Have you seen a change? Uh, are there organizations that are understanding uh, the independence that is possible to get good people onto their boards? I think it's difficult to say because I, I think it's still a mixed bag. Um, some I know definitely know that some large organizations use um, search firms to try and um, find the right type of uh, candidate that they're looking for for their board and looking specifically at um, diversity as well. And I think I think that's great. Um, there's also some companies that advertise their vacancies via the IODSA where we would advertise it to our designees to then apply for those vacancies. So I think they are moves in the right direction.